Every August, the city of Oshkosh, Wisconsin swells to nearly 10 times its size when the EAA Air Venture flies into town. This is one of the most impressive aviation gatherings in the world, with everything from old school biplanes to state-of-the-art military hardware. The sky and the ground are filled with magnificent machines. Welcome, I'm Bill Stevens in Oshkosh, Wisconsin for EAA's Air Venture, the 50th anniversary of one of the longest running and certainly unique aviation events in the entire world. In fact, there's so much here, there's no way we can show you everything on this show. However, we wanted to start out by showing you the Warbirds of America. This is Vic Krause, he's the chairman of Warbirds of America. They are vintage military combat aircraft and everybody loves them. We got something for everybody here, Bill. It's, uh, it's an amazing field. Uh, Warbirds commands the entire northeast quadrant of Air Venture, and we've got 12 different energy zones. We've got trainers. We've got an area with uh, the T-28s, a big uh, trainer that's celebrating its 70th anniversary. A uh, lot of anniversaries this year because these aircraft were back uh, you know, in the Second World War and post-Second World War days. Well, I know you're anxious to see some of the aircraft that Vic just told us about. So if you're ready, here we go. Well, if you're familiar with World War II military aircraft, you probably know this is a P-51 Mustang, but it's a pretty special one. One of the very earliest prototypes and the first one put into U.S. service. This one right here, this is the granddaddy of all of the great P-51s that came after. When you're looking for an aircraft that brings with it plenty of history, P-51 pretty much fills the bill. The P-51 is, is the poster child for combat aviation uh, in World War II. It fought in every theater uh, during World War II. Uh, it was fuel efficient more so than the other American fighters and it helped uh, escort the bombers all the way to Germany and back and then over the Pacific. So that was its importance and it was a phenomenal fighter as well. It could turn with the best of them and uh, it, it was a very potent adversary in the sky. It can do eight Gs, which is pretty hefty. Uh, top speeds, 427 miles per hour. It didn't have the, the huge, like, 2,000 plus horsepower motors that the Corsairs and P-47s had, but it's, it's uh, more aerodynamic. It's a very physical, loud, visceral experience, and it's an honor, honestly, to be able to be a you know, caretaker of this piece of history for, for now. This airplane's nicknamed Lopes Hope because we're honoring Don Lopez, who was in World War II and flew P-40s and P-51s. Later went on to actually becoming a curator of the Smithsonian. Was a very, very well-liked and respected individual, and he flew Mustangs during the war, specifically C models. Why was this plane so formidable? It was the first airplane that could actually escort the bombers, fight a fight, and turn around and make it back. Nobody else could quite get there. This is a North American XP-82X, means it's experimental. It was designed, started the design in November 1939. Pap Arnold came to North American and said, we need a, a twin engine Mustang that is 50 faster than a regular Mustang. There are 272 built. This is the very first one to fly. It flew 15 April 1945. Now, it did not see service in World War II. It was a test ship until November 49, where it skidded off the runway, an icy runway up there in Cleveland, and it bent the center section. They didn't need it anymore, so they were gonna scrap it. Walter Soplata 
came and found out that he was the man that bought a whole bunch of these old airplanes, and he paid $300 for it back in 1949 or 1950. He very carefully took it apart with a chainsaw, and then I bought it from him and scrounged the earth for more parts to try to build a complete airplane. It's been a 209,000 man and woman hour restoring the airplane. It's been a, a huge job, and everybody said it couldn't be done, and well, <laughs> here it is. <laughs> Well, this is one of the fiercest warplanes from the World War II era. This is a Curtis P-40 Warhawk, better known as a Flying Tiger. What a history. These aircraft were campaigned in China by volunteer American pilots to help protect the Chinese from the advancing imperialist Japanese forces. And it also reminds me that I should brush after every meal. Anyway, when we come back, we'll join the Navy and see some of the warbirds that made history from their perspective when we come back to Top Coats Magnificent Machines. Top Coats Magnificent Machines is brought to you by Steel Rubber Products, quality crafted rubber parts and weather stripping, Clamp Tight, the clamp making tool, and by Top Coat, the best coatings in the world. Welcome back to Top Coat's Magnificent Machines from EEA's Air Venture in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. The aircraft park behind me is a Grumman F-8F fighter plane. And when you see the retractable wings on these aircraft, that's a tip-off that when it was in service, it was carrier-based, another proud fighter in the U.S. Navy. Just one of many of the Navy-based warbirds here in Oshkosh, and we're going to take a look at a few more. These aircraft right here had such a major role in World War II, didn't they? Absolutely. Uh, they developed this aircraft to go against the Japanese Zero. The first uh, iteration, the prototype of the Corsair, actually had straight wings, and they realized the gear would be so long, there was no way for it to handle the carrier operations. So they put that gull into the wing to lessen the length of the gear so they could handle the uh, aircraft uh, landing configuration. What made these planes so dominant and so successful in the war? Probably the largest engine propeller combination at the time. And so they took that engine propeller and built the airplane around it. This is a Pratt & Whitney R2800 engine, which is 2800 cubic inch, by the way. It has large cylinders and pistons, and so it burns a lot of fuel. The fuel line is about an inch and a half diameter. And so you can see the exhaust stain because a lot of gas is being burned in this aircraft to develop 2,600 horsepower. Has well over 200 combat missions in Korea and uh, just an amazing vet. Our next warbird, the TBM Avenger, is well known as the plane flown by former President George H.W. Bush. And this model, owned by Brad and Jane Deckert, travels the country as a tribute to the men who flew these planes in combat. When we first got the plane, we didn't really know what we were getting. But when we met our veteran friends that actually flew in these and participated, won our hearts over. So we love to keep it for them. John, tell me, what goes through your mind when you see this aircraft sitting here? Well, first of all, it's amazing that there's even left. There were so many of them were destroyed afterward. And uh, it brings back a lot of memories from when I first flew in 43 and all the way to 45. So this was a good airplane? Very, very good. It took a lot of punishment. F-11 works on everything, including aircraft. You can use F-11 on every square inch of this aircraft. And it works awesome. Not only will it make it look new and, and, and look shinier and look great, it'll also reduce the drag in making this plane more efficient and have better fuel economy in the air. Right, Scott? Well, yeah. I mean, really, what does it come down to with aircraft? It's performance and it's safety at the end of the day. And when it comes to performance, F-11 really is an amazing product on that. 
you're talking about coating and protecting every square inch, but you're also improving the, the aero, you know, dynamics of it, the efficiency of it, the speed of the aircraft with Top Coat F11. That's right. And also safety. Like, Scott, you can do a lot of things with F11 that make it safer well, for yeah, an aircraft. Absolutely. You know, we get this a lot where we have a lot of pilots tell, tell us this all the time, but one is, hey, what would you do to my plane? You made it faster, right. which is funny. <laughs> Uh, right. But more importantly, safety, right? Because F-11 can be used on every surface, when it comes to your acrylics, your windshields, all your glass, okay, F-11 tremendously helps with that because what are you doing? You get micro scratches in, in those materials. F-11 will actually help fill that in and, and make it where visibility is more enhanced. That's the whole beauty of F-11. That's right. So not only will it look new, when the sun hits that windshield, the pilot will be able to see a much better because normally those spider webs and swirl marks will blind you when the sun hits it, but F-11 reduces that. Yeah, significantly. So whether it's performance and safety or just general appearance, your leading edges of your wings, you know, keeping it clean from the dirt, the dust, the debris, obviously. F11 is definitely your go-to product on that. So if you want to learn more, you can go to our website at topcoat.tv. When we return to the EAA Air Venture 2019, we'll turn our attention to the bombers that flew in World War II. We'll even fly along with a B-25 on a mock mission. So stay tuned for more of Top Coat's magnificent machines. Welcome back to Top Coat's Magnificent Machines from Air Venture in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Well, so far we've seen some of the most formidable fighter planes in World War II history, but parked behind me, that's a B-17 Super Fortress, one of the bedrock aircraft from America's bombing campaign during World War II. This is an aircraft that could reach speeds of 300 miles an hour, carrying tons and tons of bombs. And you want to see some more bombers from World War II? We're about to show you a few. The B-25 changed the outcome of the war early on with the Doolittle Tokyo Raiders. Uh, April 18, 1942, 80 airmen, 16 B-25s launched from the aircraft carrier Hornet, changed the course of the war in the Pacific. This particular airframe you're looking at was built in uh, fall of 1944. The airplane that is marked to represent, Panchito, served with a 396 bomb squadron, 41st bomb group, out of Okinawa during the summer of 1945. My airplane is not painted, and during the war, paint takes up a lot of weight, it slows down production time, and even in the theaters of war, many crew chiefs would get so proud they'd take flour, and they would buff and polish their airplane, because this airplane actually is harder to see in the air than one painted, like, next door. Dark green, that's real easy to see in the air. This makes it harder to see. Here at AirVenture, we see a lot of different World War II trainers. Those planes did not actually engage in combat, but they helped to train the pilots and the bombardiers who did. John Hess owns this Beach T-11 park behind us, and these planes really did have an important role during the war, didn't they? Yes, they did. So during World War II, they needed bombardiers. So it's pretty expensive to fly a B-17 or a B-24 and train bombardiers. So you have what's made to be a smaller version of a B-17 that has a Norden bomb site, bomb racks with 100-pound practice bombs. These guys would be able to just practice on and on until they got their accuracy right before they transferred to a B-17 or a B-24. How many of these were built and how many still exist today, do you know? There are close to 2,000 of them built, both for the uh, Army Air Corps and the Navy but they only, uh, there's only about five of them flying now. Well, up until now, most of the warbirds we've seen have been fighter planes, but you know that fighter planes need things to fight with, which are delivered by cargo planes, like this uh, Douglas DC-3 that's behind us, owned by Mikey McBrien. These really were workhorses for so many years, weren't they? Oh, these are the, the world's best workhorses, freight, cargo, uh, you know, paratroopers, everything. They even built floats on them. They, everything in the world you can do with aviation, DC-3 has done. So this aircraft uh, was built in Oklahoma City, participated in D-Day and uh, Operation Market Garden. Uh, and then right after the war, 1947, it flew uh, back to Canada on the Lend-Lease program. 
uh, converted by Canadair to a DC-3C. After that, the Department of Transportation, which is now uh, Transport Canada, operated until 1989, where it sat dormant for 27 years until I found it on eBay. We gave ourselves 56 days to get it done, and we got it flying for the 75th anniversary of D-Day. This is all volunteers. It just proves that what you can do if you find something that people love. Anytime you have a major event like Air Venture that's been around for 50 years, you know there's been a lot of history made. Dick Kapinski is the Director of Communication for the EAA, and everywhere you look there's history here. It starts with the history right here by the Brown Arch, the original entry to the flight line back in 1970, and that history has grown with airplanes and people in the 50 years since as the grounds have grown. Take us back to the early days and the growth curve that this event has gone through. Well, it started in Milwaukee, 1953, 21 airplanes, 150 people. 1959, moved to Rockford, Illinois. Then in 69, outgrew the airport there, came to Oshkosh. Unique, a large airport, two big runways that do not cross, lots of room to park airplanes. You know, with so many activities going on at this event, it's probably hard to pick out your favorite like everyone else. But what are some of the most popular? Some of the most popular are uh, the air show, of course, in the afternoon that we've been seeing behind us, uh, the Warbirds, the world's biggest gathering of Warbird aircraft any place in the world every single year. The vintage airplanes, the home builds, all of that, and the new technology, too, that's coming to the fore. And there's plenty of entertainment, too, musicians and stage shows, things like that. There are. We have opening night concerts. We have different entertainment throughout the entire week. And a lot of aviators are entertainers, too, and they participate. Impromptu, impromptu, it's all here in Oshkosh. When we come back with more of Topcoat's magnificent machines, we'll put on a British accent and see the plane that helped win the Battle of Britain. It's a jolly good trip back in time. <laughs> here at the EAA Air Venture 2019. Top Coast Magnificent Machines is brought to you by Brothers Truck Parts, your number one source for 1947 to 87 Chevy and GMC truck restoration. AP Laser, leading the way. And by Top Coat, make life easier. Welcome back to Top Coat's Magnificent Machines from EEA's Air Venture in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Anybody who's even vaguely familiar with World War II combat aircraft is familiar with the name Mosquito, the aircraft parked behind us. Warren Denholm, you performed the restoration on this fabulous aircraft. Tell us about the condition it was in when you first laid hands on it. Yeah, well, it was barely recognizable, actually. You know, because the airplane's made out of wood and left sitting outside for, you know, 75 odd years, uh, it was uh, just a pile of bits, really. People didn't think these airplanes could ever have another life, and so they never bothered looking after them, and they just got left outside, and you know, the ravages of time take over, and before you know it, you can, you can almost fit it in the trunk of your car and take it home. How many of these are left? Any way of knowing? Well, there's, there's quite a few in museums that will never fly again. Uh, we've done, this is our third restoration, so the, we have brought three back to flying condition. There's one in Canada that uh, has been flying, and, uh, but it's uh, not flying at the moment, so there's really only three flyers, and they're all here in North America. Everywhere you go at EAA Air Venture, you see aircraft that really grab your attention, like the Ferry Firefly, parked behind us, owned by Captain Eddie Kurtzel. This has quite a colorful history going all the way back to 1941. That's exactly right. Uh, the aircraft was uh, basically the test flight in uh, 1941. Its first combat mission was in 1944, and then it went on in, to the uh, Pacific Theater. It was the first British airplane to fly over Japan, first British airplane to fly over Tokyo during the war. Can you tell us a little bit about the restoration on the plane? Okay, the restoration, this aircraft, was sold at auction in 1966. A town uh, four hours uh, west of Sydney, they bought the aircraft for $400 and they put it up on a pole and it was up on the pole for 40 years. And so that's where this came from and this is a result of basically about 10 people working full time for eight years. It's 45,000 man hours to complete the restoration. 
Well, from the rather unfamiliar to the very familiar, behind me is a 1944 Mark 9C Spitfire, and it's flown by this gentleman here, Warren Peach. And this aircraft really was responsible for shifting the power in the air war over England during World War II, didn't it? It certainly did. It's the iconic fighter for the British uh, Empire. And this particular airplane flew 74 missions in World War II. The Spitfire is not as fast as a Mustang or a or uh, some of the later airplanes, the P-38 and stuff, but it's still a very quick airplane, and it's not hard to get it going 300 miles an hour, and in a dive, you can get it up to 400 pretty easy. When you're flying this aircraft, I guess you have to flash back to those war years and just imagine what it was like for those pilots to be in combat with this. Absolutely, and it's one of the honors of flying this airplane is not only the time spent in the seat, but just to think about what that airplane has seen and the kids that were in it fighting for their homeland and everything, but also to get on the ground. It's always been remarkable to me when you see a, a World War II veteran get in the airplane and put his hand on the throttle and watch him turn 18. He can remember everything from those years, and it's, a, it's an amazing honor. Time now for this week's Top Coat Top Pick, and it is a legendary warbird that is also a movie star. This B-25 flew with the Army Air Force during World War II, and then in 1970, bearing the name Berlin Express, it was featured in the film Catch-22. It was recently overhauled by the magicians at the EAA Museum and is back in the air. That wraps up this episode of Top Coat's Magnificent Machines. But there is so much more to experience and enjoy here at AirVenture 2019 that we're coming back for more next week. Vintage, classic, and antique planes will be on tap, and you won't want to miss it. <laughs>